Oh, so drawing, yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Uh, uh, Ilya says, uh, even though your videos have been focused on painting lately, there's still a great deal of carryover of your tips into drawing. Speaking of that, I'd be curious to know who are some of your favorite draftsmen in ink or pencil or whatever. So this is me just wandering around because I actually enjoy this this uh, part of, of our field uh, enormously. Uh, uh, the fact that I happen to be a, uh, a uh, painter who paints by the mass doesn't mean I don't have a great deal of love for the line uh, and uh, the, the articulation of form and, and, and shape and that whole combination of creating unity in a, uh, in a, uh, in a convention like that. So um, I thank you, uh, Ilya, for the suggestion, and I'd, <laughs> I hope you'll take this for what it is and, and what it isn't. Um, this is just me reflecting on some of the things that have inspired me from the time I was first looking at painting. And of course, as I became a more um, um, educated individual, more um, having s more experienced, having seen more in the world of drawing, uh, my taste changed. And uh, so some of these are from the earliest days and they haven't changed and other things um, uh, are, you know, are in that category. I remember coming into Gamel's one time, <laughs> Gamel one time and I've mentioned it maybe before, but I showed him this little start of a, of a drawing by by um, Degas, not a start, but but an actual a start. Meaning early days of Degas, he has this uh, drawing he's done. I think it's a figure holding his arm out. You've probably all seen it. I'd seen it in a show at the Shepherd Gallery in New York, uh, and it's a gallery that had begun to show uh, the nineteenth century academic type of uh, work and the, you know the great traditional representational work. And um, my hats off to them. I have no idea where they all went, but I really do appreciate that, and I want to express that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> not that I'll ever see this. But um, back in the 70s, but, um, uh, but I was so impressed by that. And I had the catalog from the show, so I went and showed that to, uh, to Mr. Gamble as I was studying with him. And he said, well, basically, you'll get over it. We all used to do that. Isn't that funny? <laughs> and here I was thinking it was one of these great drawings. But your education, you know, as you become more sophisticated, more, you've, you've drawn longer, you've looked longer. You're going to change, and I don't show those. I maybe I should have shown that with the Degas, but I'm going to show you what I consider to be one of the things that always inspired me as being great draftsmanship. And 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 take it for what it's worth. You can redefine the word any way you want, um, but for me, draftsmanship uh, uh, boils down to this uh, a couple of things. One is that the sheer plausibility um, of the thing. You know, does it look does it look plausible as nature? Are the shapes good? Are the are the, um, are the forms uh, beautiful? Is the art is the are the mark, is the mark making beautiful to look at? Uh, are the values good? You know, to whatever extent they show. Hmm. So um, I I got sight of this Michelangelo early, probably through uh, Robert Hale's book on uh, great masters in art or something. I forget what he called it, the great masters of drawing or something. This is Robert Beverly Hale down in, at the Art Students League. And I believe I saw this picture on the left here from the Metropolitan Museum for the first time there. It's a, I think it's about a foot high, so it's one of the larger drawings he's done. And I think the one on the right might even be that size or even bigger. Uh, but uh, this guy at that point embodied great drawing to me. And, uh, and I still, he still maintains... One of the things that you may want to look at when you're looking at this picture is um, the, uh, the presence of lines that are appearing to try to be what they look like, not, not construction drawing of any kind. And, um, uh, and that's what you're going to find characteristic of all the draftsmen I run into, I'll show you here. So some of my favorites, here's Michelangelo, beautiful line quality, great sense of unity despite working in such a piecemeal kind of a way. In a sense, everything we do has to be rather piecemeal. You have to do that by the pieces, but the fact that you come around to a great unity and, and to the extent that this figure, uh, or either, is, either the, the one on the right is, a, is from probably the drawing from, the, uh, from that river god, uh, which I think might be, I think it might be Roman sculpture. Way early, ancient Roman sculpture. Uh, maybe, and the sources may even be unknown. I'm not sure where that comes from, but it was, a, it was one of his favorite pieces along with the Belvedere torso. And if you know those two pieces, the Belvedere torso and this river god, you understand Michelangelo's greatest influences, in my view, at least in terms of sculpture. But the one on the left is like the Belvedere torso, 
who knows how much of it might even be borrowed from it. But mentally, remember, you're a painter as a, you're, as a draftsman. You're always, or in any aspect of painting, you're always borrowing from other people. You're always getting, you're getting insight through what they've done. And um, so that borrowing is what we do, right? Uh, and, um, but so that's characteristic and, um, and sort of models the beginning of that. So I consider these two drawings eminently worth your time um, for those several reasons. Uh, the, the sense of form, uh, not the least of it. So Leonardo's got the reputation for being that dra that great draftsman, and his line quality is astonishing. The, the things he's done with hair. And remember, uh, these these two drawings on the left here are, which are Da Vinci's. They're drawn. They're drawn from life. Michelangelo's appear to be uh, significantly made up. I'm not saying the one on the right. I know what that. The, you know the extent he had the, that figure of that uh, sculpture sitting in front of him. Uh, so I can't tell you for sure how much of that was drawn from life. Um, but it was not typical. It was characteristic of him to actually create the stuff more like, uh, well, you'll see uh, everybody who's ultimately doing uh, imaginative painting has a certain amount of that, Rubens in particular, has a certain amount of that um, creating your own figure thing. But this is done from life, Da Vinci, and um, it's some of the most beautiful um, uh, uh, line work you'll ever find in, in, in our form. And uh, uh, you can see it in the hair of the figure on the left, the profile. And then, of course, that the drapery studies he's done are, are sort of classics. Uh, this, is, this is only one of any number that he did, uh, drapery studies, and um, you'll find that uh, they became models for everybody, uh, you know, including myself, a <laughs> young student, you're trying to you set up drapery and that you find beautiful and, 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 and have a shot at that stuff. There's some, there's some nice opportunity there for, for um, working out uh, aspects of drawing and so on. But uh, anyway, those two are excellent examples of things where the work is done from life. And again, notice the um, the line. You know, you know, whenever you see early and faint lines in these things, that they're not construction lines; they're actually shape making. So the idea of making it as like as you can the first time, articulating the shape, uh, is is key. And then the whole body on the right has, you can see the line thing, very th very thin lines, uh, are uh, uh, similar too, and give a similar look. His has considerably, as I've said before, more of a look of tracing. But this is still one of those remarkably unified. Uh, articulations of form. Would you believe I've got my first call uh, since we started doing these today? <laughs> All right, good for me. Um, so again, that remarkable sense of unity, the efficiency that is Holbein so famous for is the efficiency of doing it with so little. And um, uh, not over modeling and all that sort of stuff, but getting all of it, just beautiful, beautiful, very, uh, very, um, Efficient work. Um, you know, you should just look at these instead of following my lead on these. I mean, just look at them. Find your own over time. Find your own uh, uh, great master set. You know, and a good place to start is that book by Hale. Just start there. He he actually makes some very very good choices. I think both of these might be in that book as well. But they're just ones that I stick in my memory. I didn't go around looking for things to try to give you the lecture on drawing. These are just my favorites. Um, it, in the case of the one on the right, uh, in fact, in both of these, you can see that he's considerably a piecemeal worker. And as Gamel used to say, you know, I don't know how you can make a thing without the piece. You need the piece, you know, to get the whole. But it's a, it's really a wonderful. You can see, when you see him pull a leg like this together into this incredibly true-looking unity, you know, where the parts truly do hang, ultimately produce a one, you know, a, a sense of the one. Um, this also is an example of the um, of the working from the outline and uh, and then f modeling within it a sort of characteristic of you know all drawing uh, at a certain point you know before you get to the true chiaroscuro drawing um, by certain individuals such as this represented by the Boston School anyway beautiful chalk um, Raphael has this reputation for being the divine Raphael some of it was related to his drawing skills. But uh, this again, the bit right here is an example of working like Michelangelo from the piecemeal, lots of little pieces, and then this whole massive time spent pulling all that stuff together into a unity. The back of this one here uh, is a nice example of how you go from being uh, Michelangelo with the what 
what da Vinci referred to as a bag of walnuts look, uh, which in Michelangelo's case is stupendous anyway, to being, uh, and some of them much more so like that, by the way, do look more like annoying that way. But to going to, and Tenoretto, by the way, seems to have followed the Michelangelo line that way. A bunch of his stuff is just lumpity, lumpity, lump, lump, lump. <laughs> I can't think of a better way to say it. But when you get to the, this back here, you see considerably more of a naturalistic unity. And you remember going out of a place where you have no real great models greater than yourself. Uh, uh, Michelangelo had, um, and, and you know, Da Vinci, all these guys were having to sort of really figure it out for the first time. Renaissance being what it was, it was a rebirth. Is a reinventing. We're in that phase here in our own country and the world right now too. So have at it. Um, do your very best, but and use the masters as you can, as you can. Study them, draw draw them, copy them. I don't take anything away from Rubens. I don't put him at the top of the great painters, but uh, but as far as painting, painting a figure, uh, the articulating form thing, you know, and and maintaining a major unity. This guy is staggering. Uh, you know, the, the sense of form is wildly impressive, <laughs> you know, to the extent that it actually feels, it starts feeling seriously exaggerated. But I say that, I want to be to say it thoughtfully, because you always have to consider what light these guys drew in. And um, so a fairly narrow light source from the, you, so you can see it significantly from above, will give you a far greater sense of form than a front-on light, which is more like this is, than a front-on light will. But... Um, and he's one of these guys that seems to work f rather from the highlights. And I think that's a significant part of what makes the exaggeration, the appearance of exaggerated form, uh, is this spectacular uh, popping of the highlights. Uh, he is also a guy who's not just working with one uh, value going, you know, like, like a red chalk. And I say one value, that's not what I mean. I mean by using not black and white and a middle tone, but he's not, so he's using whites though. This guy's actually using lights as well as darks and he often does it on a, on a middle value ground. Uh, I've done some of that. It's really a pleasing uh, look. And, and uh, I wonder where those drawings are. You should have shown me some of those uh, one day. So, uh, but this one is the fog and we all copied that. Um, you know, we got into the fog and were able to sit down with these drawings right in front of us. And we would put drawings, paper side by side with them, copy them. Uh, so there you are, that's the Rubens model. and. Uh, you know, I'm particularly a massive fan, a fan of massive form. I'm a big fan of great form. Sculptural form, really, really wonderful stuff. And uh, another person who does it, Millet, is also reputed, or his own account is he didn't work from life. Uh, he virtually never worked from life. He, he, want, he used his memory. One of the things that uh, is impressive about these also is the way they hang together and also look plausible. That being the case, now... Um, but, yeah, and I don't know how to, I don't know how to, you know, it's very difficult to want to project things you really don't know. This one on the right happens to look much more like the person was sitting there. This one does typical things, characteristic of, of his uh, way of working, that uh, look like he bar he's, bar he's borrowing stuff from various aspects of things he knows. You can work this way, and uh, but what, what's great about this guy, again, what makes him fascinating to me at least, is his great sense of form. Uh, his sense of great forms, the great forms, you know, the, the great form, not the, not the, not the articulate little, littleness, but the management of the great forms. So that's Michelangelo, way up there on my, uh, Mil Millet, I mean, way up there on my list. Um, Ang, of course, uh, you know, he's sort of like the godfather, so to speak, of the, um, of the, uh, uh, academic world in, in France, at least at, for, at a certain point, and these drawings are, are are awesome drawings as well. I've always been stunned by this top one, um, and it's got a few of the things that are characteristic of the David training, which is like some of the toes and things. Some aspects of it look like they were painted uh, from a I don't want to say from a formula, but I sort of mean that uh, they're slightly less. Uh, um, different from what you get when you're just, when you're painting the scene. And what you see when you get to Degas, what you see when you get to Degas is that orientation around drawing just what you see. And this is, so this, at this point here, you really see a guy who's just left away all the formulaic sort of things and uh, is drawing. And I consider these, you know, he really, for my, for my money, if you, can, if you count it to be this ability to create the shapes that look true, 
uh, and articulate uh, the great forms with with unbelievable unity. You know, he he really is a a top uh, player, and I think he has more unity than almost anyone. Uh, Rubens has unity, but not that combination of truth. He's got a, a sort of a made up, even a cartoon like quality. So I, I, I hold this in a higher esteem uh, just in terms of the truth to nature, and I hold it that way in some senses for our students, for students to think about it that way. You know, when you're thinking about who to copy, copy somebody who gets unity. But this one on the left here is very similar to the one that I showed Mr. Gamble. And, uh, at, but this one, by the time he gets to these drawings here, he's really Mr. Unity. And I get the impression he may have done his memory studies between um, those drawings, which I think he did in Rome with uh, some other French young guys. Um, and uh, and I, I get the impression that these are far more more uh, uh, a product of his um, memory work. And uh, who else do I have here? Of all my... Uh, well, of course, of course... You know, I don't know how you cannot include Sargent, and I've always found that Sargent's uh, articulation of uh, form, whenever he was inclined to go for it, has always been spectacular. It's got the, all the draftsman-like qualities you'd ever possibly want. Now, this one is a study for something, you know, for a. It's, but he's but he's got a guy sitting there for life. But it's a study for one of his pictures. Actually, all these probably are. And that's, again, as I said, most of the drawings that I value, the ones that I value most, are not drawings for their own sake. They are drawings. Their studies for something, but this one on the right is where you can see the early uh, uh, um, massing, you know, sort of this, an orientation around line and mass, uh, much more dramatically than you see in uh, in all the drawings I've shown you so far. So this this the sort of forge of Vulcan kind of a character, uh, <clears throat> or is it, um, <laughs> or is it um, the steel driving man? Anyway, uh, so Sargent is always there on my list somewhere. Uh, I don't happen to favor the body of his work. And one of the things I really wanted to say to everybody is that I don't go and pick draftsmen and say, though so-and-so, a great draftsman. I, I, it's not my, I'm not interested in that. What I'm looking for for myself is to develop my skill as a draftsman. So I look at what I consider to be great draftsmanship. And so I'm always looking for models of that, things that model aspects of great draftsmanship rather than going and being a follower of one of these guys. So I pick drawings here and I pick drawings there. I can like all these guys, they work differently from each other, uh, but they model different amazing things. Of course, the same old thing applies, the unity and the sense of efficiency that most of these people apply, the sense of uh, unity though and, and great form. These are the things that all, all this stuff really, uh, uh, you know, great shapes, great forms, great hanging togetherness, you know, these are the things that model great draftsmanship to me. Oops. I set that up to block some of this light. It's only getting worse. I think I I think that's good, Mr. Producer. Let's see if that turns out okay. Now, uh, at the time of us, somewhere around the time of um, uh, Sergeant, there's also this guy uh, <laughs> who Gamble called Disgustus John. And I've hugely admired this guy's drawings. He's got some of the qualities. He's you know, he's clearly a good a student of good drawing. He's got some of the beautiful qualities of da Vinci, maybe most notably. Again, you can see a guy who's drawing long lines and not doing anything like construction drawing. You know, you, you can't do construction drawing, in my view, and get a good drawing like this. I'm talking about one that's efficient. and Efficient meaning get right to the point with as few lines as possible. And, uh, but, 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 but what a master this guy is, and yet there's a bunch of his stuff I wouldn't tell you to look at. He seems to get lost frequently in getting the head sizes right on a figure, for example. Um, and similarly, I really like this particular one by Fetchin, and I like his sort of mood. It's always He's always got a great sense of form and a beautiful line. And um, again, that's characteristic of good draftsmen. And uh, yes, in, in, my own, in my own way of thinking about this stuff. So, but, but, you know, most of his stuff winds up being in a, a much more offensively cartoony um, uh, fetch and stuff does. The more you look at it, the, the less appeal it has. So that, in the end, it's a little bit like Rubens that way. He sort of, and I'm not talking about the drawings, Rubens' drawings, you know, because you can isolate that stuff and talk about form and stuff. It's one thing, but, but um, I, I'm not a big fan of the general sense of exaggeration, almost cartoon-like qualities 
uh, when people do that, I think you're now, uh, and this might not amuse the, who was it who spoke to me? Maybe it's you, Rob, again. Um, but your interpretation, <laughs> for some reason, the more I get of your interpretation, of your peculiar, uh, um, you're bringing your peculiarities into nature and obviously deviating from truth, distorting, the less I like the work. And I don't know if the rest of the world is like that or not, but I suggest to you that that's a factor here that could be a problematical one for a lot of, for, for a lot of people. Um, but notably for, um, um, for uh, Fetchin and, and, and somewhat for Rubens. So... Now, I seem to have lost my laser there, so I hope I haven't been pointing. I don't think I've had much to point for, but... Um, now, as much as <laughs> I think I've mentioned before that at Rembrandt, um, I went looking for something I could afford as a, as a 15 or 16-year-old kid. I went to a used bookstore in Denver, <laughs> and I found all I could afford was a book. It was two volumes set for $5 of Rembrandt, and it was all these kinds of sketches. So, and I was thinking to myself, what can I learn from that? You know, I didn't recognize the different types of drawing that exist, but these drawings for, for pictures, ideas for pictures, I think of them as thumbnails, you know, compositional thumbnails or uh, group, figure grouping thumbnails, are spectacular for their efficiency, for getting the job done. The bottom one looks like it's ink, which even makes it more spectacular, the upper one, the red chalk. Uh, but nevertheless, this is just one of those things where you talk about drawing, you admire it in different ways, but... This actually is a form of draftsmanship when it has so much data, the sense of form and uh, the gesture proportions, all those things being plausible, but in a sketchy form, right? And so I, I've always admired these certain ones of that group, whole bunches of them really make you laugh uh, and think, man, I might be able to do better than that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then you find you maybe don't do better than that. Now, the one thing I'll end with then is these drawings that are done as pictures and um, really more as pictures. And Ang spent his life doing uh, portrait drawings, not his life, his early life. He made money doing portrait drawings. And that's Paganini on the left, very famous violinist in his day. And, uh, and they're spectacular pencil drawings. I don't think anything has ever been done that quite <laughs> matches those. And I really do like the Johns ones and that sort of thing. But Proudhon's drawings mostly look like they are actually paintings. Uh, they're char you know, like he looks like he's presenting as a painting. And I can show you more and more of these. There's a number of full charcoal drawings by uh, Millet that are that are that would be full paintings if they were in color. And like the one of the of the bread maker um, stuffing a um, or getting a loaf out of the oven. And then the one on the right is is, is uh, Lily, Lillian Westcott Hale, and to me that in the modern era, you know, once you get past, uh, once you get into the impressionist world, this is about as beautiful a char charcoal drawing as you're likely to see that incorporates the knowledge of that of that era. So, without making more of it than I have, <laughs> I hope I left have left out too much stuff, but that gets you a walkthrough of my kind of uh, of, of of what I value in drawing and. Uh, Hope you don't take it to mean anything about what, how I how I think of drawing or how I think of painting and what drawing ought to do. I'm not that guy. I'm really not telling you that. I think most of what you're going what you're going to find in most of these drawings is a search for information for an imaginative picture, and that's what you see here. And the and the more efficiently it's done, the more impressive. Uh, I don't know the, t the degree to which the upper two are portraits in their in on their in their own right, and I think I think Fetchins often were pencil portraits in their own right. I know that, but I think that one actually on the bottom also became a painting. But this idea of doing quality studies where the information you're delivering in your in your drawing can be is adequate enough for you to actually paint from, that's an interesting thing. And I've worked that you know I've worked that with that in mind, and it really does help you to understand. Uh, drawing better and what its purposes are, um, what sorts of things you must bring in, which might even explain some of the exaggerations that you see in a Rubens, say. So, uh, yeah, uh, drawings for pictures. And that's what all these are that I'm showing you. And all my, I think all my favorite drawings are those kinds of things. I'm not a fan of the noodled up, of the noodled up drawing that's just a charcoal painting. But I like them. I don't mean to say I don't like them, but I don't think of them as drawing. I think of them as something else. Uh, you know, I think of them as black and white paintings. You know, you could call them illustrations, and I don't mean that in a negative, any kind of a negative sense. By the way, all those people out there who think I mean something negative about 
there's nothing about illustration uh, that I that I don't think uh, wonderful things about. Uh, so don't think I'm a disparager of illustration. Again, these are these all three of these are studies for pictures uh, in the case of Degas, and you could look at them and think to yourself, uh, would I be able to make a painting from that? You might even try. You might even try grabbing one of these guys' things and see if you can actually trick, add you know add color to it. And, and, uh, and see if there's enough information to work from. But better off, do it for yourself. Again, studies for, um, for paintings. You all know the, uh, the odalisk down there because it's also in uh, grisaille form and uh, uh, multiple interpretation, multiple different, um, uh, well, preliminary studies. Um, early Malay, by the way, um, he would do paintings based on these kind on these drawings, and um, he would sell them. But he said one day he was standing in front of a, a gallery window and with his with these kinds of drawings in it, and uh, he said uh, he, there was someone standing near the windows, and he was over, overheard them saying, "Who is that guy? And uh, who's that draftsman or painter?" And uh, the other person responded, "said Oh, just another painter of bosoms and buttocks," and. <laughs> Millet was so offended by it, and being a person of uh, with with a religious and you know sort of a, 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 a moral sense, uh, uh, went home and asked his wife whether she 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 would al allow that they might just be poorer for a while while he figured out how to make another kind of painting. But this is the pot boiler for him for a while, so it's an interesting world, right? But this is that imaginative painting done starting from the drawings and then put, worked in the paintings. And you can find the paintings for, uh, I want to tell you both of those, but certainly the one on the right easily enough. Uh, we'll have to work on this uh, issue of the um, speed at which these move. So I just jumped over uh, Rubens. So. Again, uh, if you get a chance to copy a painting, a drawing, one of these drawings in real life, take the opportunity. Don't miss it. Uh, drawing from, drawing from so frequently, oddly photographed uh, resources is one of the. It's just not. It's problematical. Maybe slightly less so if the drawing is in really good focus uh, than painting is. But still, uh, any chance you get to, you know, find, using your own judgment, of course. Always keep thinking you're using your own judgment when you say that's a good drawing. Don't base it on anything except, you know, the people told you. Just look at the drawings and use your own judgment. Always use your own judgment. It's important. Raphael. And, of course, uh, the hist our history involving the looking, you know, that, uh, you know, the idea of studying the, the, the um, use, putting words to things like the uh, uh, light on an object that da Vinci does is a hugely, hugely important thing. So I guess I've said enough about this. Michelangelo, we can just end again with Michelangelo. All right. Well, that's that is no by no means definitive, but I think it gets you some idea of what my uh, what my my what's given me pleasure in drawing over the years. And uh, thanks for your question, Ilya. Uh, you could put a few things you know, in your own comments to me. You guys could put a few uh, suggest a few pictures to look at and or send something like that along any which way you can. My email is there. Uh, Sometimes it's easier to have these discussions with, with your actual visual input as well. All right. Well, thanking you all again for, uh, for um, um, donating, for uh, uh, sharing, subscribing, and the comments. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.